This is a production of Cornell University. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bill Weldon, and I'm a graduate student at Cornell University in the section of plant pathology and plant microbiology. Um, my advisor is Dr. David Gadori, and our lab um, largely focuses on uh, powdery mildews right now. And almost all of my graduate research is focused on powdery mildew of hops. Um, this was a presentation that I gave in December of 2017 at the Cornell Hop Conference hosted at SUNY Morrisville. Um, and I wanted to record um, a copy of this presentation and get it posted online um, so that people could access the PowerPoint and also just have some audio narration to help hopefully explain some of the slides because um, there are some animations with some of the slides um, just in case as um, anybody that's considering growing hops or is currently growing hops might find this presentation helpful. Um, so the presentation title is Differences in Managing the Mildews, and it's intended to uh, um, provide some help with staying out of trouble with powdery mildew and downy mildew, which are both uh, pathogens that we have to worry about uh, in hop production quite uh, frequently here up in the Northeast and throughout the country, actually. Okay, um, so why, why care about downy and powdery mildew? Um, well, both pathogens are ubiquitously distributed across New York and the other eastern U.S. states um, throughout the Midwest and also out in the Pacific Northwest. Um, their destruction capability uh, is quite high. Um, they're capable of causing pretty drastic yield losses. Um, they are major factors in what pushed the New York hop industry of the 20th century westward. Um, and this was largely caused, and uh, anytime it's in the yard, is the, the losses are caused through uh, distortion, browning, and reduction or variation in alpha acid content. Um, so it could change the alpha acid profile for that given variety, which would also just make that variety not acceptable for brewers' um, point of view. Um, an example of when, so powdery mildew, when it first arrived in the Pacific Northwest, it caused over $10 million in losses in Washington that first year. Um, and so it's, it's really, if it, if it gets going in a yard, it's really quite capable of causing some pretty significant yield loss. Um, so both pathogens are capable of ca causing direct loss um, through modifying, distorting, browning the hop cones. But downy mildew can also have the additional impact of uh, causing systemic infection of the hop crown. Um, so the pathogen can get into the crown of the hop plant and it can exist there um, from season to season. So it's a systemic infection that persists from year to year. And this causes indirect losses through the reduction in the vigor of the hop plant. So each season, the hop plant just gets less and less vigorous until um, it gets to the ultimate point where um, one spring it just won't push suit, uh, push new new shoots that following season, uh, and so it can kill um, the hop plant that way. So um, the importance of properly distinguishing between the two diseases. Uh, you might ask, won't won't the management approach be the same regardless of which disease is present? They're both pathogens. And I'm just going to spray fungicides in my yard if I see either. Um, and it doesn't really matter whether I know which one is actually there because I'm just going to be spraying anyways. So what difference does it make? And um, that's not necessarily the right approach. Um, and the way I think of this is it's similar to being able to properly respond to a fire versus a tornado. Um, and so both are very destructive natural disasters, a fire and a tornado. Um, but if, if you're sitting in your house and you look out the window and you see a tornado, your response when you see a tornado is to hightail it down into the basement. And that would be the right move to make if there was in fact a tornado outside of your house. However, if you think you see a tornado, you go to the basement, but in reality, there's actually a forest fire outside of your house. Then by going to the basement, you've pretty much done the worst um, worst thing that you could do in response to a forest fire. You've, you've trapped yourself down in the basement and you're gonna end up running around with your pants on fire um, and it's not gonna be a great situation. And I liken that to kind of differentiating, um, properly differentiating powdery and downy mildew um, between one another. Um, so why I care about the differences between downy and powdery mildew? 
Well, the two organisms responsible for downy and powdery belong to completely different kingdoms. So if, if you look at this figure on the right here, um, this is just a very simple tree of life. So you have like your animals on one branch, your plants on another branch, bacteria down here. Um, but the branches that I wanna point your attention to are fungi and oomycetes. And the reason for that is that in fungi, so in the branch of fungi, the organism responsible for causing hot powdery mildew is a fungus, so it belongs here. And the fungus, let's say, is your fire. However, the organism that causes hot downy mildew is not a fungus, uh, it's an oomycete. And so this is your tornado. All right, so these are two completely different branches on the tree of life. These organisms are very capable of causing destruction, um, but the reason this impacts you is that downy mildew and powdery mildew generally require different fungicides for good specific control. They're on different branches, and so the fungicides target um, that target fungi, those cellular processes often aren't present in omycetes because they're on a completely different branch. And so most modern fungicides designed to control powdery mildew do little to nothing to manage downy mildew and vice versa. So it, it's critically important that you're properly identifying what pathogen, what disease is present in your yard, um, because it really impacts how effective uh, your response is gonna be. So some fungicides generally specific to downy mildew uh, are listed here uh, on the left. Fungicides generally specific to powdery mildew are on the right. And so um, if you were to think that you had powdery mildew in your yard, but you actually had downy, and you decided to apply any of these products on the right, um, there really would be very little efficacy in kind of controlling the disease because you actually have downy mildew in your yard. Um, and these, these fungicides aren't designed to target uh, oomycete organisms. There are some uh, cases of overlapping efficacy on both powdery and downy mildew. Um, so uh, one example is pristine or flint. Um, and uh, these products will provide downy mildew suppression when used primarily for powdery mildew control. Um, so there is, there are, are a few cases where you get a little bit of overlapping control when maybe you're primarily spraying for powdery mildew, but you get some of this back, uh, backhanded control on downy mildew. Um, I wanna emphasize that these are examples. Uh, these products should always be used according to the label in your given state. And it's important to check that any products that you're using are actually labeled for hops. Um, so some of these with asterisks um, on these slides, I looked up um, as of at least December of 2017 in the 2017 Cornell IPM uh, hop production guide that they are not labeled for use in New York, um, but they are put here as examples for people that may be in different states. Um, so, now, the kind of the crux, um, how to properly differentiate between downy and powdery mildew. Hopefully, at this point, um, we have a little bit of an appreciation that these diseases are capable of causing some pretty um, drastic yield losses in your yard, and that it's important to be able to proper, properly differentiate um, the two diseases between one another. Um, so now, how, how to differentiate between downy and powdery mildew. So what to physically look for in the yard? Um, in the case of downy mildew, early in the season, um, the first infected shoots coming out of the ground um, are called basal spikes when they are infected with downy mildew. In the case of powdery mildew, these first, first shoots um, are called flag shoots. But the basal spikes of downy mildew, um, the very characteristic kind of appearance of a basal spike uh, is a very chlorotic color, so slight yellowing in comparison to the rest of the more kind of more vibrant green uh, of the healthy hop shoots. Um, there's a general downward curling of the leaves and the shoot appears very stunted. And so the distances between the points where these two leaves are being produced and this next set of leaves is very, very short. And so the, the shoot appears very stunted. Um, if you look on the underside of these leaves, you're very likely to see black to purple, purplish um, masses of spores that are produced exclusively on the underside of the leaves, and those are your downy mildew spores. Um, but this is your very characteristic basal spike, 
which you will see among the early shoots um, emerging in the spring if uh, downy mildew has successfully overwintered in your yard and is emerging um, on some of these new new shoots. In the case of powdery mildew, um, oh, so here, here are a couple more examples of uh, basil spikes in your yard or in a yard. Um, so this is a basil spike. This is a basil spike here. Um, but then there are other instances of some taller shoots, maybe in the background here, where um, they're not quite as stunted and they, the basil spikes are just very chlorotic, they're very yellow, and they, once, you, once you've seen one out in the yard, um, they tend to be quite noticeable. Um, you just have to kind of be aware um, and cognizant of what you're looking for. These basil spikes can also form on your lateral branches of hops, um, should downy mildew be present in your yard at the time when lateral branches are being produced, and those are called aerial spikes, and they have very uh, similar uh, characteristics as your basil spikes, except they're forming on your lateral branches, and so um, they're, they could be higher up in the canopy, um, but they're, again, those new buds that are, pr pr are um, pushing, and uh, you get these very chlorotic leaves with downward stunted growth, they curl downwards, and you'll, you'll likely see um, masses of downy mildew on the underside of the leaves. So in the case of powdery mildew, um, they're termed flag shoots. And these flag shoots, again, emerge early spring when the hops start breaking ground. And the buds that emerge infected with powdery mildew um, appear as this picture to the right where the shoot is very strikingly white. Um, the leaves are also typically stunted, um, but the major kind of defining characteristic of a flag shoot is just the striking white appearance in comparison to all of the green healthy tissue that doesn't have powdery mildew surrounding it. Um, and that's, that's where the term flag shoot comes from. It sticks out like a flag. Um, one other um, difference between downy and powdery mildew is the coloration of the spores. So downy mildew has very darkly pigmented spores, and this results in clusters of purple uh, to black colonies on the leaf. These colonies exist exclusively on, on the underside of the leaf, which is very, it's a very defining characteristic of downy mildew. So if, if you're questioning whether you have downy mildew in your yard or not, um, and you see spores being produced on the upper side of the leaf, that's kind of a deterrent and maybe makes you think that maybe it's not downy mildew. You should be only seeing spores um, on the underside of the leaves in the case of downy. Alternatively, uh, for powdery mildew, they produce transparent non-pigmented spores, and this re results in masses of clear spores that, when you're looking at it macroscopically, appear as white, fluffy colonies on the leaf. And these colonies can be produced both on the upper surface and the lower surface of your leaves, um, the hop cones, also the case for downy mildew, um, on your stems, pretty much any green above ground tissue um, can, can harbor these, these organisms. So these are some of your downy mildew spores. You can see that they're darkly pigmented and when you start looking at these with the other naked eye, um, so okay, in comparison, um, this is, these are your spores produced by powdery mildew and they are not pigmented they kind of appear in these little stacks of bead-like spores. And when you look at that microsco macroscopically with, with your eye, um, what you see is kind of a white fluffy colony. And so here are the examples of what you might see um, when you just look at it uh, visually. Again, notice how downy mildew is, these, all these spores are on the underside of the leaf. Um, they are black to purple, um, and so they're much darker typically than your powdery mildew colonies. And um, when you look at the powdery mildew leaf, it's very strikingly white. It's a little bit fluffier. Um, it kind of looks like snow if, if it's on the surface of the leaf. Some of the older colonies can look a little bit matte gray um, if, they're, if they're old and not producing any new spores. Um, but typically, um, the thing that gives away powdery mildew is the white fluffy colonies on, on your green, green tissue. So uh, where on the plant is the disease found? For downy mildew, and I said this before, the spores are produced exclusively on the underside of the leaves, and that is a big, big differentiation between downy and powdery mildew. The lesions will be angular, which means that if you look at a leaf and you can see the leaf veins um, kind of extending out uh, across the leaf, the lesions will be trapped in between those veins. They can't extend past those veins, and so those veins kind of 
trap the little lesions into angular um, kind of shapes. And uh, for downy mildew, the growth can spread into the hop crown and cause that systemic infection. For powdery mildew, the spores can be found on all green uh, plant tissue, and this includes both sides of the leaves. And so if you're seeing something that's forming on the top side of the leaf and you're trying to differentiate between downy and powdery, um, that's a good indication that you might be dealing with powdery mildew. And again, it cannot cause systemic infection of the crown. Um, that is only, only something to worry about with downy mildew. However, um, in both cases, the, the dormant buds that exist sort of just beneath the soil line during the winter um, can be colonized by both downy and powdery mildew. And that's how your uh, basal spikes in the case of downy mildew and your flag shoots in the case of powdery mildew emerge in the spring. Um, so this is a picture example of the angular lesions that I was talking about for downy mildew. And so you see your leaf veins and then um, there's even smaller leaf veins that are progressing through the spaces between the larger ones and those are trapping um, your downy mildew colonies into very angular shapes. Here's what it looks like from the top. Um, and again, so the spores are only on the underside. Um, the leaf on the top will start to show slight discoloration that might um, turn necrotic brown color as the leaf gets older, um, but they are in, in line with where the colonies are forming on the underside of the leaf. Um, and so that's, that's a response to the colonies forming on the underside of the leaf. Here's another case. Um, this is a slightly older downy mildew colony. Um, again, you can see those ang angular lesions, but they are turning more, more of a brown color because the colonies are much older um, and they've caused more damage to the leaf as time has passed. In the case of powdery mildew, um, you, this is just an example of the very white fluffy um, spores that you might, and the colonies that you might see um, if you're coming across powdery mildew in your yard. Um, and they are caused by the, the clear spores that build up in the amounts of hundreds of thousands and appear white when you're just looking at it with your eye. They are capable of spreading to any green above ground plant tissue. So here it is on a hop cone. Um, and in the case of downy mildew, um, it can also cause the brown discoloration. It's, it's a little bit of a darker kind of reddish brown in the case of downy mildew. In the case of powdery mildew, it's more of your traditional kind of just necrosis, and you'll probably be able to see some of the white powdery growth on the cone. Um, but the easiest way to identify these pathogens is not by differentiating how your cone looks. Um, you should have leaf um, kind of damage harboring either downy mildew or powdery mildew around, and that's, that's much easier to differentiate than trying to decide um, which pathogen is causing a problem based on how the cones are looking. So one note about uh, varietal resistance for hop downy mildew uh, is that there are two ways, as I said, that hop downy mildew can cause damage to a hop plant. It can affect your hop cones and cause a direct yield loss um, through damage of the hop cone. And then it can cause the systemic infection that causes a year to year reduction in the yield potential of that plant as it gets weaker from year to year from having been systemically infected. And that creates kind of this uh, spectrum of resistance across plants where some plants may be resistant to the foliar um, aspect of downy mildew, but susceptible to the systemic infection or susceptible to both foliar and systemic, resistant to both, or um, whichever the last one, the resistant to the foliar, or susceptible to the foliar resistant to a systemic infection. And so it breaks out into these four quadrants and really kind of results in more of a spectrum than a clear cut um, definition of this variety for downy mildew is resistant um, because there is there are so many factors at play that it, um, unless it's completely resistant to both foliar infection and your uh, crown systemic infection, then there's gonna be kind of a spectrum of the resistance associated with that variety. When considering the var uh, varietal resistance to powdery mildew, um, Again, um, there are some varieties that are published as resistant to powdery mildew in the U.S. Um, and then there are some that have recently lost resistance in the Pacific Northwest. And so the varieties Nugget and Cascade have strains of powdery mildew that have been found out there um, where the strains are 
kind of adapted to grow better than they normally um, would be able to. Um, and so that resistance is recently lost in the Northwest. And these are varieties that are worth paying attention to on the East Coast because it's worth knowing um, and tracking whether these strains present in the Pacific Northwest have made their way eastward. So another way to properly identify the disease is to know the optimal conditions for downy and powdery mildew. Um, there are basically kinds of weather that favor one disease over the, over, over the other. And so typically you get uh, general seasons that favor high prevalence of either downy mildew or powdery mildew. For downy mildew, um, these are your rainy seasons. So it's strongly favored by wet, rainy conditions. Um, seasons of high humidity and long dew periods are also conducive for downy mildew. And um, spores are pigmented, they're on the inner side of the leaf, um, which these are con conditions conducive for high humidity. If uh, this is relevant to you, this would the 2017 growing season was a very conducive season where we got a lot of rain. Um, there were long periods of leaf wetness and the downy mildew spore actually requires wet uh, leaf wetness. It requires moisture on the uh, surface of the leaf in order to be able to infect the host. And so that was a very, very favorable growing um, season for downy mildew. In the case of powdery mildew, it's favored uh, during seasons of temperate, uh, more, more dry conditions. It doesn't require water to infect uh, the plant. So theoretically, every day is a potential infection period, but the conditions that are most favorable for powdery mildew are kind of your temperate overcast days um, where there's not direct sunlight because those spores are not pigmented, the sun can damage the spores and, and kill them off. Um, the 2016 growing season in New York was, or was an example of a season that was favor, favorable for powdery mildew. Um, it was much drier than 2017, and we saw many more cases of powdery mildew that year. Uh, so, now, now that you've properly identified what uh, disease is in your yard, um, it's important to know how to properly manage both downy and powdery mildew. So kind of the first and foremost way to make your life easier is to choose resistant varieties when possible. Um, this has to be taken into consideration with varieties that are in demand uh, in the brewing industry, obviously, but when possible, um, at least always give consideration to the resistance or the susceptibility uh, of the varieties that you're planting in your yard so that you go in with realistic expectations of how intensive your disease management program is going to be. It, this is um, especially important for organic production and it will also guide your scouting intensity regardless of whether you're growing organically or conventionally as well as your spray program intensity um, because it will inform you kind of how, how at risk are you for, um, for infection of both downy or powdery mildew. So uh, you, should, you should be scouting as soon as shoots emerge and scout as often as, feasi as feasible for your operation. Um, I know this can be tough and some critical scouting periods for downy mildew are at shoot emergence at the start of the season because those are when you're going to identify your uh, basal spikes and you would want to rogue those out. Um, at the time of shoot training, this is another time that's very important because if you're growing tips of your shoots are infected with downy mildew, um, they will become stunted, they will stop growing upwards, and they will likely fall from the uh, trellis, which will require you to have to retrain shoots, which could result in a yield loss just basically by improper, or it messes with your training time. At the time of production of lateral branches, um, so those aerial spikes uh, that we mentioned, those uh, can become a problem during the time of production of lateral branches, and so you want to scout well during this time, um, because this can um, basically cause your lateral branches to be killed off, which would result in a yield loss, because those would be branches that would not uh, result in forming uh, proper hop cones. And then you should also um, be scouting one week prior to bloom through four weeks post bloom, because this is the period when the hop cones are at mo are most at risk for um, becoming infected with downy mildew. Um, so the cones are most susceptible during this time, and if they become infected during this time, they're gonna result in the greatest amount of distortion, um, the greatest fluctuation uh, away from the norm of the alpha acid level, 
um, your betas um, away from whatever that variety should be behaving as will be most affected um, if they get infected during this time. For powdery, um, again, scout as soon as shoots emerge and scout as often as possible. The two major uh, critical scouting periods for powdery mildew are at shoot emergence at the start of the season. So you should be scouting for the flag shoots and be rowing those out should you find any. And then one week prior to bloom through th uh, three weeks post bloom because this is the period when the hop cones are most susceptible to powdery mildew infection and the cones uh, are most affected and most result in kind of the greatest amount of distortion and uh, improper alpha and beta acid levels on the cones. So um, it's easy to tell you just to scout, um, and that's a very vague thing to say. Um, so hopefully those times are helpful. And then also, here's a general scouting approach. Um, so when disease pressure is low, you should be scouting one to 200 plants every time you scout. And these should be evenly dispersed among varieties and throughout your yard. You should pay special attention to the basal foliage as well as any young, still developing hop cones and leaves. Um, your basal foliage, um, that's a very conducive microclimate for the development of downy and powdery mildew. Um, so it's protected from sunlight often. Um, the humidity level is a little bit higher, so that would favor your downy mildew. Um, and this is also just a part of the yard, a level of the yard where very young, kind of actively growing uh, hop tissue is being produced and the youngest hop tissue is typically the most susceptible part of the hop plant um, for downy and powdery mildew infection. Um, for downy, look for the basal spikes and dark spores on the underside of the leaves. For powdery, look for your white powdery colonies um, and especially on your young leaves. Any uh, kind of suspect shoots or leaves that you might see in your yard, uh, you can kind of do an at-home humid chamber to try and in, uh, cause these organisms to produce spores, which are very characteristic giveaways for what disease you might be dealing with. Um, so remove a questionable shoot and place it inside of a Ziploc bag with a damp paper towel. For downy, you wanna store this bag at room temperature in the dark because they sporulate in the dark and that will, um, be the easiest way to confirm whether or not it's downy mildew. For powdery, uh, store it at room temperature in a spot that gets daily light dark cycles because that is associated with how powdery mildew produces its spores. And the end goal is just to try and get the shoot in question to produce spores because that's the easiest way to um, figure out what, what organism, what disease uh, you may be dealing with. So uh, check for production of spores after one or two days. Obviously, um, fungicides are very crucial in control of both of these diseases, and it's important to know your fungicides. Um, so it's crucial to know which fungicides apply to downy mildew or to powdery mildew. You can check the label if you're unsure. Sometimes it won't specifically say downy mildew or, or specifically powdery mildew, um, but it, in those cases, it often will say other organisms that if you do a quick Google search, you could figure out whether that's a fungus or an omycete. If we think back to that uh, tree of life, um, the fire versus the tornado. Um, and if there's a bunch of omycetes listed on that label, it's likely applying to omycetes, which is a, is a downy mildew organism. Um, but just check the label if you're unsure and be sure that you're using the right fungicide to target the organism that you think is in your yard. There are many applications and decisions to make beyond the label, um, so you need to think about the efficacy of the fungicide, um, the potential for resistance, so maybe saving your big guns for just the most crucial times during the growing season, the longevity, uh, retention, redistribution of these, um, so there's decisions just beyond um, deciding what fungicide product you want to use. Like I just said, uh, save the big guns for your most critical management periods. In the case of powdery mildew, this would be around bloom. Uh, those one to three week uh, period that we were talking about. So your Quintec, your Pristine. Again, make sure that these are products that are labeled um, for use in your state. Downy mildew, uh, this could be Revis plus phosphorus acid, Zampro. Um, these are typically kind of big guns um, for control of these pathogens. So you wanna save them for your most critical, critical times where you need great control. There are some shared cultural practices um, for both downy, and mildew, downy mildew and powdery mildew um, that are kind of the legwork 
quote unquote, um, to make your fungicides work better. Um, so if you do this stuff, um, it's easier to keep these diseases under control and your fungicides are, have greater efficacy if um, kind of these cultural practices are, are part of your management approach. Um, so pruning and or crowning um, are, is a strategy that you do at the start of the growing season to remove some of those buds that may have uh, overwintered with powdery or downy mildew on them. Um, and so this would cut back your first flush of growth, essentially that may have uh, shoots that would eventually become your basal spikes in the case of downy or flag shoots in the case of powdery. And we, we kill those, those off. And so then hopefully that second flush of growth that comes from deeper in the soil um, does not have any powdery or downy mildew on it. And you're left with only healthy hop tissue. The training time is important uh, because it gets the shoots that you want up off the ground and away from all the basal foliage. Um, and then this allows you to focus on cleaning up that basal foliage, which can harbor and be kind of a microclimate ideal for development of both of these diseases. Um, stripping the lower leaves is an option. Um, and so, I have some photos associated with this. And so pruning, these might be your first flush of growth, cut these back. You might um, uh, be able to remove either the basal spikes or the flag shoots that emerge in this flush of growth. Training times, um, picture associated with that. And then here's a picture to help describe what we mean by stripping the lower leaves. Um, you're breaking the green bridge. Um, so all of that basal foliage, the hop tissue growing along the soil line, that might connect each plant, uh, kind of bridge that, that distance between the, the plants. Um, so this distance right here, um, we're, we're splitting that up and we're also increasing airflow through the yard. Um, stripping the lower leaves is not recommended for uh, young yards. So your first, your second year yards and also some varieties don't respond well to um, losing their first three feet of, of leaf foliage. Um, so your less, less vigorous varieties might, might uh, this might not be something that you'd want to do for them. Um, and here, here's an instance of what I mean by uh, the green bridge. And so you can see this hop tissue going along the soil line and effectively connecting these two plants to one another. And so it could feasibly happen where powdery mildew just kind of crawls along, spreads from leaf to leaf, and all of a sudden you have it in this plant. Um, and so anything you can do to break that green bridge is good. Some good sources of information to reference. Uh, the Cornell Integrated Hops Production Guide is put out each year. And this is New York specific information regarding uh, labeled chemistries. Uh, so each year that list gets updated and changes slightly. Um, it's available through the Cornell Bookstore. And um, this is not relevant. Uh, I guess the relevance now, um, as this is posted, is that the 2018 edition is available. There's also the field guide for integrated pest management and hops. Uh, the link can be found on the USA Hops website with the research and technical tab. Um, I think if you do a Google search of this title, um, you can find it on a, on a handful of different websites, a link to it, um, but that's one that has worked for me in the past. The 2017 Michigan Hop Management Guide, um, they did a very, very nice job uh, there at Michigan State University Extension, um, and that's a very good uh, management guide, another one for the East Coast. And then um, one of my projects that I've been working on is to put together a hops web page for Cornell. Um, and so we have that here. So if you Google, Google search Cornell Sips Hops um, or follow this URL here, you'll be taken to the hops page uh, for Cornell. Um, and here um, we've up, up loaded some outreach uh, content, um, some um, disease management stuff. So management of hop downy mildew, managing the mildews. So kind of a, a pared down version of this talk. Um, five considerations for forever planning your first hop, management of powdery mildew. Um, and this is something that we hope to continually update as more articles are put together. That is where this um, talk will be uploaded to and um, is hopefully just going to become kind of a reliable source of hop-related um, content. So with that, um, 
Thank you for your time. Uh, feel free to email me if you have any questions. My email is on the first slide. It's ww395 at cornell.edu. Um, and with that, uh, yeah, thank you. Here, here's my email again, and um, I hope you have a good day. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.